Jamila, can you talk about your personal background? So I um, am Dr. Jamila Hokinson. I am an instructor and researcher at Yale University where I do um, clinical research, primarily with psilocybin. And we study it in OCD populations and depression populations. And we are looking to study it in young adult populations. Um, we also have training to do MDMA. Um, and so we are looking to do an MDMA for a PTSD kind of clinical trial as well. So that is my primary focus, but I'm also interested in uh, BIPOC, people of color, getting them more access into these clinical trials as well. So let's start about the last element. How much access people with color have uh, in, in the US to, to clinical trials? Surprisingly, very few. And I think that is multifactorial. Um, there's a history in the U.S. of taking advantage of people of color in clinical trials. So like the most famous one is like the Tuskegee experiment where they were, black people were experimented with syphilis and not told that um, and uh, ended up having huge, you know, suffering from that. And there's been other kind of atrocious um, clinical trials like that and in our history. And I think that has left uh, BIPOC people with a very suspicion, suspicious of uh, clinical trial researches from large scale academic institutions that are largely white. <laughs> and so, which I can totally understand. And especially then when you, so we did a kind of a, um, a qualitative survey uh, of uh, BIPOC individuals to see just about their, you know, interests in psychedelics and if they've used them and what their hesitation is for like engaging in this sort of in work. And it was actually pretty interesting uh, because one of the myths is that the BIPOC people do not benefit from psychedelics and that is completely not true. And we're actually gonna publish a, uh, our research paper there um, here in a couple of months, but it actually showed that um, they are using psychedelics on their own and are having a positive experience with it. And so, um, and they do would like access to mental health. Um, there is a suspicion about this being in academic institutions in a locked kind of unit where you have people that don't look like you and you're taking a mild only substance and have restrictions on what you can and cannot do. So it's a, when you, we go through the informed consent with them, it's, it is not surprising that they end up being like, no. And a lot of them actually talk to their support system that they have and the support system is just not on board. And so I think there's a huge kind of psychoeducation that needs to happen first in the BIPOC community to get them comfortable with sort of what the what this kind of treatment is, um, as uh, well as all of their support system to actually include them. Psychedelic field is often criticized because it's a white middle class elitist thing. Do you agree? Oh, I think that's totally true. Yeah, it's totally true in our trials for sure. Uh, the trials that, that we have run have been largely white. We did do uh, have a good mix of uh, gender at least, um, so that was that. But you know, we we don't. It, it largely white heterosexual. So even like the people with different sexual orientations are sort of not accessing these treatments for for whatever reason. And so yeah, I think that is absolutely true. That it is more of a white affluent male kind of dominated culture, which I am afraid of you know, when it is legalized, that it will continue to be so. And that um, BIPOC people and other people who would benefit from this treatment will be sort of shut out of this kind of treatment modality. OCD, which is an acronym for Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, uh, is often used in colloquial language. We say that I have OCD on that and this. So what is the scientific definition of OCD? I know it's a, yeah, a term that's used quite, quite often with people saying that I, I, I'm, I have this OCD or not. But for us, um, so OCD is, is, has a pretty defined clinical uh, definition and it's uh, and the primary assessment tool is the, the, the Yale Brown um, OCD sort of assessment tool. It's called BIBOX, Y-B-O-C-S. Um, and it looks at uh, people that have um, obsession, obsessive thoughts that are distressing to them that cause a significant time in their day, usually over an hour, where, where these um, thoughts are like really interfering with their life. And then it can include, but doesn't have to include, a compulsive action. 
by which they do to try to relieve themselves of these thoughts. So a common example is fear of contamination. Uh, and so a person may just, you know, if they have touched something that they feel is contaminated, they will have this anxiety and discomfort about their hands being contaminated and they can't get it out of their head. And that may last, you know, hours until they engage in some kind of washing ritual. And then the ritual itself has to be like, is usually, uh, the ritual is not just, oh, wash my hands, I'm done. The ritual is usually, okay, I have to wash my hands with this particular soap in this particular way, this many times, rinse them, then do the soap again, then rinse them. And so it's quite, quite intense. I had, we had one participant that had very um, severe kind of contamination when it came to the bathroom. And so she would spend 12 hours in the bathroom until she felt that she was clean enough to come out of the bathroom. What are the mental health consequences of, of having OCD? Well, there are several. Um, many, the big one is, is that most people who have very severe OCD have a hard time functioning in their day-to-day -day life. So it, you can imagine that this can impact how they, the job, and so they may not be able to maintain employment because you know, an employer does not want to see you in the bathroom for 12 hours a day. Um, it uh, can impact their social life because uh, if they're engaged in rituals, uh, it's usually by themselves and then they're not socializing or interacting with people. And so they tend to, to not lose, they lose friends. The, relation, the relationships can be um, lost as well because if they're engaged in a relationship, obviously the partner, you know, may not be uh, supportive of all these kind of activities, especially one participant, you know, had their OCD was about leaving the house because they felt that if things weren't perfect in the house, the house was going to be like set on fire or whatever. So there was like frequent checking to make sure the stove is off and that's off and that's off. And it took her two hours to get out of the house. So she was always late to things, uh, which frustrated her both her partner and her families. Um, in our case, we saw a lot of... Um, for the people that had really severe OCD, education sort of interruption. Some people couldn't finish high school because of it. If it started in high school, they couldn't finish college. If it started in college, you couldn't go on to finish whatever their master's degree is. So it can have a huge impact on their quality of life where they're not basically living a life that you know, would they would find joy and happiness. And most people with OCD, are not happy that they have it. You know, it's really kind of, it's a thing that they don't want to have. Do we have any idea what causes OCD? You know, I don't know off the top of my head what the, what are, what the, the causes are. I think they are probably multifactorial. You know, there, you know, there could be, and I, I can only guess because of what we, the treatments are. So what the treatments are, are um, medication. And so there's some, probably some theory that it causes some kind of chemical imbalance in the brain that, uh, you know, antidepressants um, may help with. So probably like the serotonin syndrome or something like that, serotonin uh, system. Um, and then it, uh, the other treatments are really intensive therapy, like exposure response therapy is like a mainstream treatment uh, where they're like exposed to their whatever their trigger is, and then they have to sit with it without doing the compulsions, and then just basically kind of meditate on that. And that is over and over and over again. So there, there's, there is some theory about then um, the, the thought process is sort of like very rigid, which, which I think is common in most disorders. Um, if you think, I like think of it as I'm a skier, so I like think of skiing. If you think of skiing and you ski down the same mountain over and over again, you start to make a track. And then if, but if you want to ski down a different side of it and you cross over that, it's just sort of interrupts your, you can't do it. It's hard. So you can end up following the same skier tracks that other people may have set. And that's how the, I think the brain works, especially with OCD and depression is that this sort of rigidity of tracks sort of gets set. And then it's very hard for them to overcome that. If we have other forms of treatment for OCD, why do we need psychedelics? That's a really great question because, um, and in our clinical trials, uh, they've had to have failed all the traditional treatments. Yeah, so they, so you know, they ended up the it could either be medication or therapy. Most people have tried both, and most people have tried multiple medications and multiple therapies, and it has not worked for them. And so, at least in our clinical trials, this is like kind of like a last resort for them because they've actually tried everything else. Uh, and so we were, you know, one, one, really wondering if this could be something that for those who are refractory to other treatments could this really help them get unstuck? Like all of our participants are stuck in some manner. And, th and that's kind of how we define it. And they just cannot move from that stuckness uh, in their OCD symptoms. And can this help them facilitate some movement? Hence why we're trying to study to see if it actually does work. Do you have any theory about how psychedelics 
treat OCD? Yeah, we're working on a, actually a qualitative study that one of my colleagues is actually leading, Dr. Chin, and he is actually getting published in his results um, here pretty uh, in a couple months as well. And I think they do kind of elicit some, you know, maybe theories as to what may be happening with psychedelics. So I can give you a preliminary review, but I think the, the more detailed analysis is fully coming. So um, one of the, uh, the the theories is that uh, it um, it helps the participant sort of have an understand if they can get, get there in the dosing session, understanding of the OCD is not them. And so it's like, most of the time with, what they describe OCD is, is this control box that is like, they're like OCD is controlling them and they can't do anything because it's controlling them. And then with psilocybin, what they, what they really find, some of them, is that, oh no, I'm in control. This is the OCD, but I'm in control. And so if they can get to that insight, that is where we've seen like a really powerful shift that they have and a reduction in their OCD symptoms um, thereafter. And it doesn't happen for all, uh, but for those that does happen, it's, it can be really powerful. And so then it doesn't really cure their OCD and we don't really tell them that it does cure their OCD, but they have a different relationship with it. So now they can move forward in life and the OCD is there, uh, and but they are the one that are in control. And so they can choose to engage and listen to the OCD because sometimes maybe it's helpful, but they can also choose to not listen to the OCD. What do we know about the effectiveness of psychedelics in treating OCD? Actually very little because um, there's only one other study that was before ours and that was an open label study and it was a very small pilot. Um, and so that study did show that people had um, remission of OCD symptoms after you know a few weeks and that was the only study. So our, our study that we have just finished and that we will be publishing results soon is the first study in looking at OCD uh, in a randomized controlled clinical trial. And so uh, our study shows that for some it is helpful, like for you know roughly about 75% of our population that we did. Um, and again, keep in mind though, this was a white heterogeneous population. It was not really that we did not uh, have a good diversity response in our study. But for this study population, it was um, effective for you know uh, roughly three fourths of the participants. And also I would say our primary endpoint was at 48 hours. Um, and so, of course, two days later, most people, even the ones that didn't respond later on, had a reduction in symptoms at 48 hours and actually at one week. And then what we, what we see, though, is that 25% of our participants after that one week mark had a return of their OCD symptoms. So it either became the same, at the level same, or even worse. Can you share any other interesting insights you learned at this study? I think there is. So there is a couple. Um, one thing that I really appreciated is how stuck and severe people are as I sit with them in the dosing session and um, how much really severe anxiety comes up when they feel like they don't have control, which is what psilocybin sort of does because uh, you have all these symptoms that start to emerge. You don't know really what they mean. Um, and so... It can be very uncomfortable for them. And I, and I just really appreciate it. Wow, this is hard. This is really hard for them. And all of them had challenging experiences. Um, like it wasn't like an, I walk in a park and I, you know, I know that some people have, may take psilocybin and maybe euphoric and all this bliss. And this is not our population. They, it was very challenging for most of the participants. And so having facilitators there that were trained and supportive was extremely helpful for them. I don't think they would have been able to do this on their own because of the, of the challenges that they faced and worked through. And so that was like a big insight for me is that this treatment does need like clinician support for, for the severity that we treat. So if we're talking about patients that have very severe OCD or, dep or depression, clinicians that are trained there to support them is what's probably gonna help them make the most of this experience. What kind of psychedelic drug did you use in the trial and uh, how did the sessions look like? Our, our psychedelic drug for the OCD population was psilocybin. And this first study that we did was actually a weight-based study. Um, which, you know, has really pros and cons to it. So the weight-based study was based on the weight. So therefore, people that were really small and petite actually got a small dose, 13 milligrams. People that were larger and uh, not, you know, had a little more mass to them had a higher, had a higher dose, and, but that max dose that we had was like 20 milligrams, which is significantly less than what other clinical trials are now doing, which is not weight-based, 
25 milligrams, like a set dose. And so our, 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 um, our other studies that we have going on now are the fixed dose. So that was one. So it was a weight-based dosing. So to keep that in mind, which may have caused some variability in people's experiences, people that got the lower end may not have had an intense experience um, versus those that a little bit higher. And um, the placebo control was niacin. It was 250 milligrams. I wouldn't say that was the greatest placebo control. People could usually guess what they received after about an hour into the treatment. Um, we only had one participant that didn't guess that and actually felt like they got the, the actual psychedelic treatment and had a psychedelic experience on niacin. So that was pretty interesting um, to, to see. And how the dosing session went. So this is also a unique study in that it was an inpatient psych psychiatric study, which uh, for OCD population may not have probably been the best sort of setting for them uh, because there's a locked inpatient unit. So they have to be admitted on Monday and they're discharged on Friday. They have to stay in these very sterile rooms. You know, it's just not as com it's not at all comfortable. Um, and so that was our study in terms of design. So they were admitted on Monday. They, we, did, we do have an MRI, MRI imaging component to the study, and so maybe those results also will be published uh, as we analyze them. But because they had an MRI like on Tuesday, uh, the baseline MRI, and then both on Monday and Tuesday, they had a preparation session where they met the facilitators for the first time. So this is also interesting that they did not have a relationship with the clinicians, right? It wasn't like a long-term thing. It was like, oh, I'm just meeting you for the first time. Tell me about your life story. And so we really tried to build a sense, it was a two-hour two hour session, we really tried to build a sense of trust, you know, getting to know them, getting them comfortable with us. Uh, most of our participants actually uh, found the preparations to be very beneficial and enabled them to sort of trust us in the dosing session. The dosing session was on Wednesday, um, and so they, it started generally around 9 to 10 o'clock, and then usually it ended up about 5, 4 to 5. Um, and then obviously they, for the randomized phase, they were either randomized to placebo or, or niacin, and both the facilitators and the participant were blinded to that. So we did not know in the session what they were getting. And so we just had to work with them, but we had to stay in the session no matter if we thought they got placebo or not and just sort of work with them on those, on those feelings that they were coming up. The next day um, on Thursday, they, uh, it's kind of what we call a rest day. They just have ratings that they do. And then on Friday is our 48 hour integration where we kind of then talk, talk about sort of the experience, uh, kind of make sense and meaning of it. They also then find out if they got placebo or niacin um, because then they can opt, in, opt into an open label phase uh, two weeks later. Um, and if they got the placebo, um, that, that they will open label, but if they got um, psilocybin, then we have like just integration follow-ups you know, thereafter. And throughout all this, we have like a battery of ratings that we do. <laughs> so there's a ton of like self-reports that they end up uh, taking, you know, both before the session and then right after the session. <laughs>